everybody. Thanks for watching Rock and Recovery this week. I am here with Ryan Hampton. Hey, Ryan. Hey, hey. So happy you're on the show. I'm so happy to be on the show. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about your background and who you are? Sure. So most importantly, I'm a person in recovery, which means I haven't felt it necessary to have a drink or a drug or any other mind-altering substance since February 2nd, 2015. And, you know, current day, like today, you know, we're here in Albany and uh, I was here speaking at the uh, the Friends of New York uh, recovery conference, which was so you know so excited to be a part of. Um, but I didn't just wake up and decide I wanted to be an advocate. I wanted to write a book. I wanted to get involved on a real community uh, level with with pushing for pro recovery legislation and advocacy. Um, I before I um, you know experienced full-blown substance use disorder addiction, mm -hmm. uh, which started in 2003, um, I had kind of this up-and-coming career in, in politics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, community organizing, I, I worked for local political campaigns, labor unions, um, uh, political candidates, uh, did a lot of political organizing on the community, state, federal level. I even worked uh, in the White House from 99 to 2001 uh, at the tail end of the Clinton administration. And then in 2003, as a result of a injury that I had with my, my knee and my ankle from a hiking accident, um, I was prescribed a very high-grade opioid uh, painkiller, Dilaudid, uh, mm -hmm. followed by Oxycontin and, and other pills, um, which led me down kind of this, this road of full-blown uh, addiction, substance use disorder. The nexus for me, though, was I had moved from Washington DC back to Florida mm -hmm. in 2000, late 2003, early 2004. And um, if you know anything about Florida during those times, particularly South Florida where I was, that was the height of what was the pill mill crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and I got caught up in the pill mill crisis, you know, uh, pretty deep. Um, you know, people ask me all the time, did you just, you know, take a pill and become addicted? No, I mean, it, it's much more complex, I think, than that. I mean, as a you know, younger as a child and, and young adult, you know, there was a lot of um, adverse, you know, trauma within my family and divorce and, you know, father going to prison. And, you know, I was very much in the closet about uh, being a person, uh, also an LGBT person. Um, so th there was a lot of things that led to that perfect storm moment for me, mm -hmm. um, which happened, you know, in Florida uh, at the pill mills uh, and led me on a, you know, basically a decade of uh, in and out of treatment centers, homelessness, you know, on the streets, uh, not being able to get help, eventually getting cut off from those pills, um, somewhere around 2008, mm -hmm. uh, when Florida had instituted their, their first version of the, the PDMPs, which is the Physician Drug Monitoring Database, which was this big database of anybody who was getting medication and the prescribers and what pharmacies you were going to and whatnot. Uh, and I was cut off from all legitimate or illegitimate uh, doctors at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and someone who had been uh, dependent on these medications for some time, uh, there really wasn't a choice. You know, the day I got cut off from the doctor, uh, I, you know, had gone into full blown withdrawal very soon, mm -hmm. uh, very quickly. Um, within hours of after being discharged from the doctor's office and that was the day I, I started using heroin and that was the downward spiral. You know, eventually I, I did uh, access treatment as a result of having Medicaid uh, in California, uh, in Los Angeles, California on the Thanksgiving Eve 2014. Um, entered treatment, uh, entered a recovery residence after that, um, kind of lucked into a, a good scenario in terms of recovery supports and mm -hmm. um, being able to be supported uh, in, in different areas where I hadn't been before at my previous attempts at recovery. Um, and, you know, it led me onto a sustained path. I'm almost about, you know, in, in February, I'll celebrate five years. Yeah, Yay. yeah, no. That's I'm, a lot of days, Ryan. You know, it, it is a lot of days, but, um, the, the journey into advocacy and kind of activism was accidental, it wasn't planned. Um, you know, that happened as a result, you know, early on in my recovery, um, people very close to me started dying, just kind of, you know, one after the other, after another. Wait a second, let me back you up for a second. So, mm -hmm. when you um, finally found this recovery, mm -hmm. how important was um, sober support 
to you. Yeah. Recovery supports were critical. I mean, that's what that's what just, that's what got me to where I'm at today. So, you know, my treatment experience this time, you know, back in 2014, was nothing spectacular. It was actually nothing different than what I what I had experienced before, okay. um, with the exception is that I, I fought. You know, my family fought very hard to be able to advocate for me to get on medication. So I was on buprenorphine in the in the early part of my recovery. Uh, buprenorphine did save my life. Um, there, there's no doubt about it. I uh, was on it for probably the first three and a half, four months. Um, but the the recovery supports were what were really critical uh, for me. The day I left treatment, even though I didn't have any money, um, I was able to access a, a sober house. I was able to access peer recovery supports. I was able to plug into a community uh, that was able to, to lift me up when I couldn't lift myself up. Um, I was also able to access Medicaid, so I was able to go see a doctor, you know, um, and, 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 and behavioral health, you know, uh, uh, specialists mm -hmm. um, that I didn't have access to previously. Those Wait things were critical. Now, what about once abstinence happens, okay, or mm -hmm. once you, you put down the, mm -hmm. the drug that's bringing you to your knees and you're on mm -hmm. um, medically assisted treatment or mm -hmm. whatever, once you're at that point, um, how important are those services right then? Like, oh, those are like the crisis services. So, I mean, like, you, you mean the recovery support services? How, are, how important yeah, are they then? Yeah. So, I mean, I... How do you stop from going in the revolving door? What's well, the difference? Yeah, I mean, the difference is, is that a lot of people will go into treatment, um, which is kind of like the crisis phase, right? Mm -hmm. Which I had been through multiple times, and then they walk out of treatment, and people figure, okay, we're done, let's get back to life, right? Um, it doesn't really... The, the best outcome doesn't come from, from that way. Right, you, you, you need to have the support services that are long term, that include housing, it also includes getting a job, it includes plugging into a community, uh, you know, having some sort of a, a recovery pathway community is so important. Um, you know, you don't look at, you know, uh, people who, who are diagnosed with cancer and say, okay, all you need is, you know, your, your chemo once a week and then we're gonna do this for three months and, or four months and um, then we're, we're never gonna see you again. Mm -hmm. That's not how we do that, right? We right. treat it for, literally for someone for the rest of their life. You know, they have a community support group that they plug into, they come for regular checkups. You know, that's it's the same thing with addiction and recovery from addiction. You know, people can't just go to treatment, leave, and then we're fixed. No, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a long haul. Um, those checkpoints weren't in place for me uh, for many times. I didn't even know they existed. You know, and neither did my family. I mean, I didn't, I had, I had no idea. Um, that's what saved my life. That's what continue, continuously saves my life today. Awesome. The advocacy, though, as I was saying, was, was something, you know, after friends dying, um, I started getting more involved because, m for the most part, a lot of them were dying while they were seeking help, right? They were being kicked out of hospitals because there were no beds. Uh, they were being kicked out of sober homes and dying on street corners. And, um, it, it just didn't seem right. None of it seemed right to me. And the, the further I kind of researched and, and started to look for more people that were doing this work, uh, it became more apparent to me that there were thousands of people out there and organizations that were doing this work, and I just needed to find them and connect with them. Wow. It's amazing. You know, thank God for you. You know, recognizing no, thank that. Thank God problem. for all the people who have been, been doing this for a long time. I mean, there's... There's a lot of people that have been doing this work. I'm just happy to, to work with them and, and, you know, see how we can collaborate to amplify our collective voices. Yeah, I'm grateful that you use your platform to speak out on these issues. Mm -hmm. We're going to go to a break. Oh, we'll be right there. Great. Okay. <laughs> you're, so, you're so good. You've done this before, haven't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lots. Yeah. Okay. Um,